Welcome, everybody. We have an, another speaker today, and you can see that I'm not in my home office as usually, but I'm here actually on the Hip Campus, and we're doing a hybrid event today. So this is quite exciting to bring the online and offline worlds together. There may be one or two problems here, but I think we will be able to beat of, uh, to compete with them. And you see here that we have a um, speaker today, and this is uh, Jesse Jokerst. He has completed his bachelor's at Truman State University and after a PhD in chemistry at UT Austin with uh, John McDevitt, he completed a postdoc with Sam Gambier in Stanford Radiology. Now, now, as an associate, associate professor in the Department of Nanoengineering at UC San Diego, the Jokers Group is eager to collaborate on projects broadly related to human health and nanotechnology. In the talk today, entitled Focal Acoustic Imaging in Medicine, Jesse Jokers will present ongoing research of his lab and an innovative, non-invasive imaging technology. So it's a great pleasure to have Jesse here just have to check that I'm not always looking over to him because he's actually in the same room. So Jesse, it's really great to have you here and I'm very much looking forward to your talk and the stage is yours. Thank you so much um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, this is my first in-person talk since the pandemic. So what a treat. Um, thanks to Daniel Stromer for organizing and for uh, the invitation. So sorry for starting late, um, but I'm gonna just dive right in and tell you some of the themes of my group. Um, so we're broadly focused on imaging, primarily um, uh, ultrasound imaging, acoustic imaging and photoacoustic imaging and some of the hybrids. So um, as Andrea said in the introduction, I'm a chemist by training. And so a large focus in the group is actually on contrast agents and contrast media, um, particularly those that are based on a nanoparticle formulation. And so um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that today. Here are some of the papers that the group has done over the years um, using different nanoparticle formulations for, for imaging. Um, but given the spirit of the institution um, and the real strengths of, of this institution in imaging, I wanted to talk about three translational um, projects that are underway in the lab. So all three of these are grouped broadly under the umbrella of photoacoustic ultrasound. So first, um, I know a lot of you are familiar with photoacoustic ultrasound, um, but for those of you who aren't, I wanna talk briefly about how the technology works and some of its strengths and limitations. And then I'm gonna go through three case studies. Uh, the first is therapeutic drug monitoring for heparin, which is an anticoagulant. The second is in the area of oral health. Um, so monitoring diseases in the mouth of the gingiva. And then the third, the one that brought me here um, is in wound care and using photoacoustics to um, monitor and predict response to therapy for chronic wounds. So the technique that we're describing today is photoacoustic ultrasound. And what I, the, the simplest explanation is that it's a light in sound out technique. And so traditional ultrasound we have a transducer that's emitting and receiving ultrasound waves. And so these ultrasound waves are echoing, basically they're reflected and refracted off of tissue. And as those move back to the transducer, that's what creates an image. In photoacoustics, it's light in, sound out. So there's a very short nanosecond light pulse and this light pulse creates ultrasound through a mechanism I'll describe briefly. The advantage is that it combines the contrast of optics with the temporal and spatial resolution of ultrasound. So to illustrate that a little bit more, I wanted to maybe talk about the limitations of pure optical imaging. So in this slide, I have a laser pointer shining through a beaker of water. And if there's just water, 
the laser pointer shines through very nicely. We have a lot of contrast of this laser pointer on the paper towel behind the beaker of water. But if I add one drop of yogurt or two drops of yogurt, you can start to appreciate that this, these photons are scattered, they're absorbed, and there is simply less contrast um, and poor spatial resolution because the photons are scattered. So this is what happens when we try to use optical modalities in a living system. All, our bodies are not quite a beaker of water with a drop of yogurt, but <laughs> um, fairly similar. The next slide is a ultrasound image. And so this illustrates sort of the problems with ultrasound in terms of poor contrast. So what I'm, the yellow arrows here are indicating an ovarian cancer mass, the UB is the urinary bladder. And so the types of um, outstanding radiologists like at FAU and other institutions would be relatively would, would be able to pick out this ovarian cancer mass, but this is still a low contrast image. So poor contrast in ultrasound, poor resolution in vivo with optics. So that's what photoacoustic imaging starts to do is combine the advantages of each, the contrast of optics with the resolution of ultrasound. And so the mechanism is based on absorption. And so as you see these photons move through tissue, they hit an absorber. And when that absorber absorbs these very short light waves, they have a pressure uh, thermal expansion. So this thermal expansion event creates pressure waves, which can then back propagate out to our transducer. Don't think of this as a bulk temperature rise, right? There's no, we're not heating the tissue because this is a 50 nanosecond pulse at five hertz. So the vast majority of the time, there's no light on the tissue. It's just a periodic pulse. Um, and that short pulse is, is important to not have that local temperature rise. If you do have a local temperature rise, you're, um, you're not gonna be creating any photoacoustic signal. So that's basically the mechanism is wiggling this tissue through a thermal expansion event and causing it to produce a uh, pressure wave. What's some of the advantages is that we can start to have color ultrasound. So by exciting at multiple wavelengths, we can have multiple color channels of information um, and start to have multiplexing uh, to, to improve uh, specificity. Limitations, we still have to get light through tissue. We, so this is never gonna be a whole body technique. Um, so we still are working in the first five centimeters of tissue or so. It's still very difficult to go through bone. Um, we still have to have some kind of coupling. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> Best of both worlds. <laughs> um, and so, is that mine? No, okay. So we still can't go through bones or air, limited depth and we still need light. But despite all of that, it's a very versatile technique and it's very versatile because lots of stuff absorbs light, right? And so some of the main absorbers that we use are hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin and hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin have very different absorption spectra. And so by using two wavelengths shown here by these dotted lines, they don't have to be 700 and 900, but uh, using known molar extinction coefficients, we can have two equations, two unknowns, and we can start to back quantitate not only how much hemoglobin is in a given voxel, but how much of that is oxygenated. Lots of other materials absorb light, small molecules, nanoparticles, proteins. A lot of what my lab has done in terms of just publishing lots of papers are these small molecules and nanoparticles that can be responsive to things like reactive oxygen species or proteases. In terms of translation, these are, these are harder, right? These are just harder to um, deliver an exogenous agent. But the good news is there's lots of endogenous information that we can use uh, from photo, in photoacoustics. Okay, so with that introduction, I wanna talk about uh, the first case study and this is in heparin anticoagulation therapy. There's 500 million doses of heparin given every year. Uh, these are people, these are almost all inpatients, uh, people in the surgical suite, people in intensive care, uh, people on ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. 
Uh, so a very powerful anticoagulant. It's difficult to manage though. There's, um, it's manufactured um, in swine processing actually. And so there's a lot of variability in batch to batch and uh, patients develop heparin sensitivity and um, heparin uh, dosage issues. And so the activity, this is just kind of a cartoon of how the activity can take a while to titrate into this therapeutic window where we have the patient anticoagulated, but not so anticoagulated that there's a risk that they're gonna have a hemorrhage. If they're underdosed, that's when you have a risk of clotting and embolism. So this region where the drug is safe and effective is, is important. It's important to titrate the patient into this region. How this is done currently is with a blood test called the partiothromboplastin time or the PTT. So you draw some blood from the patient, take it to the lab, see how fast it clots. And this is done every 12 to 24 hours, and then you change the dose based on the results of that test. So what the vision here was is that what if we could have an imaging test that rather than every 12 to 24 hours could do every five to 10 minutes, where you could very quickly titrate the patient into that therapeutic window and keep them in the therapeutic window. And so this was largely led by Jun Chen Wang, who was one of my very first PhD students. He graduated in 2019, and he's now um, in the private sector in Arizona um, with Illumina. So the way this works is that, or the vision at least right now, is that this would have some real-time feedback from one of these wearable sensors that would feed back into the IV infusion pump to control the dose. And then this IV infusion pump is delivering the heparin. The way the photoacoustics comes into play is through these interactions between the FDA approved dye methylene blue and heparin. And if you look at the structure, methylene blue has this delocalized positive charge on this phenothiazinium ring and heparin is a polysulfated glycosaminoglycan. So negative charge on the heparin, positive charge on methylene blue. So these interact, uh, methylene blue dimerizes. As it dimerizes, trimerizes, creates these higher order structures, fluorescence goes down. And as the fluorescence goes down, what happens to that absorbed energy it is released as photoacoustic signal. So one of the questions that has come up time and time again on this is how is this specific? But we have done this in blood in over 90 patients now. And we routinely, there's definitely background in blood, but we're also definitely imaging the, uh, the heparin activity in this whole human blood. And so, because it is an electrostatic interaction, right? This is not just, there's, it's purely electrostatic. So there's a lot of room for non-specific um, signal, but there's just not a lot of other material that has this level of polysulfation that can grab this methylene blue. Next slide. So this is one of the very first experiments that we did where we took a constant concentration of methylene blue and put it into these little capillary tubes. So the image on your left is capillary tubes sealed in agar, an image with both ultrasound and photoacoustics. So the photoacoustic signal is in red and the ultrasound is in black and white. So same concentration of dye, but increasing concentration of heparin turns on this signal. And then we could use the known antagonist, protamine sulfate, and at the same concentration here, we have the same concentration of dye and heparin, but we're titrating in the antagonist, the protamine sulfate and our signal turns off. So that's proving, that, that, that's proving the mechanism of this interaction. So what do you do with this? Um, the, we've been working, this has been a tough nut to crack, um, is to coat this heparin active layer onto a heparin sensitive catheter. So these people already have multiple catheters delivering 
saline delivering heparin, heparin's given intravenously. So what if this catheter was not only delivering drug, but also monitoring drug, and then there was an external uh, transducer that was sitting there imaging in real time. The reason it's been a tough nut to crack is because these catheters are made of very inert materials. And so how do you get a dye onto the catheter and maintain its ability to interact with heparin? So we've looked at covalent approaches, non-covalent approaches, but we've sort of settled on a hydrogel that makes the catheter a little bit bigger than I would have liked but we can coat this. Um, this one is comically large, just to illustrate for slide purposes, but we can tune this thickness based on spray coating, um, electrospray, other, other techniques to put this coating on the exterior of the catheter. So then this is photoacoustic imaging again, not, this is not capillary tubes. These are these different catheters that have been dipped in different concentrations of heparin and you can, appreciate the signal increase with more and more heparin. And so our detection limits are not quite as good as with the free dye, but still um, well within the clinically relevant range, which is roughly below seven or eight units per ml. And so then the, the most recent work that's been published at least is with Bill Penny at the UCSDVA, the Veterans Administration Hospital and so he collected samples from us, for us, not from us, um, for us from his patients who were in the surgical suite and were given high doses of heparin. And so as part of the standard of care, Dr. Penny was measuring the ACT, which is the activated clotting time. It's another blood-based metric of how fast does blood clot. And so the value here is seconds. How fast does the blood clot? On the Y-axis is our photoacoustic signal. And so we're showing this really nice correlation between the photoacoustic signal when we take these exact same blood samples, dip our catheter in it, rinse it off and go image it. So it would be nice if this catheter was in the patient's vein. That's a whole other level of regulatory complexity than simply drawing some blood and dipping um, the catheter in it. Um, but the, the correlation here is quite encouraging and shows that we're not just imaging heparin, we're actually imaging function, right? We're imaging the activity or the clotting of the blood. And so um, we could also then correlate this with the cumulative heparin dose. So these are frequently two, four, eight hour procedures. So these patients are frequently given multiple doses of heparin. And so we could correlate the photoacoustic signal with the cumulative heparin dose and show again, this good correlation um, as well as this panel C is just a sanity check to show that our activated clotting time also correlates with cumulative dose, which it should. So future work in this space in, is uh, reducing the size of this catheter to the point that we can put it into a animal model. Um, and then working on wearable transducers, flexible transducers that would go on top of the catheter. The nice thing is, is we don't have to have, we're not even really doing imaging, right? You can kind of think of this as photoacoustic sensing, right? We don't have to make a nice image. We just need to know overall total signals. So this can be a relatively affordable um, sort of design. It doesn't have to be a high frequency transducer, doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be big. So the second topic I wanna talk about is in oral health. And this was, um, has largely been driven by Col Colin, Coleman Moore, who's gonna graduate uh, this year and will be really missed, has been a fantastic student. Um, this, is a, this is, in oral health, what is the imaging? Right? The imaging is either visual inspection or it's an x-ray. A lot of disease in oral health has nothing to do with bone, has nothing to do with dentin. It has to do with soft tissue, right? And so the last time I had this oral exam done, did, done they did this procedure called charting where they poke this little stick between the tooth and the gum. I, 
that I'm glad this happened. Someone in the audience has had this done because if it's a young audience, they're like, what are you talking about? That's so weird. But um, <laughs> you lay back and they go four, four, five, six. And what they're measuring is how many millimeters can they cram this little metal stick in between your tooth and your gum, right? And if your tooth and your gum are attached together really tightly, like they should be, you can't poke this stick down very far. But if you haven't been taking care of your teeth, your tooth is kind of loose in that pocket and therefore you can poke this stick down farther and farther and farther. So you, you want a shallow pocket depth. You want a depth of two, three millimeters. If it's six, seven millimeters, watch out, you better start flossing. So the last time I had this done, I thought there has to be a better way. And so the, you know, the problems, I didn't like it, but you know what? Dentists don't like it either. Periodontists don't like it. There's a ton of variability. It takes two people, one to do it, one to write it down. And so, you know, differences in hydration status, patient's discomfort. So the vision is that what if there was some kind of oral rinse that would be combined with a either mouthpiece transducer or kind of a stylo, stylus um, transducer, a small pen-like design that could non-invasively go zip and export all of those probing depths. So what would be a good contrast agent in the mouth? So thinking fast regulatory approval and this is coming from a nanoparticle person who loves to make nanoparticles. It turns out that these adorable little sea creatures, cephalopods, you know this, that when they get scared, they emit this puff of black ink. And so it turns out that that puff of black ink that they spit out is made of melanin nanoparticles. And it also turns out that cuttlefish ink is a popular food ingredient. You may have had squid ink pasta in Mediterranean cuisines and different parts of the Pacific Rim uses um, cuttlefish ink in foods. And so I thought of all the things I can get approved to quickly be put into people's mouths that will also absorb light, it's this stuff. And so first of all, we just look, does it produce photoacoustic signal? Yes, it sure does. Is it sensitive to the different pHs that are in the mouth? Not really. Um, and so then we started doing a bunch of swine studies. And so the black and white here, again, is the uh, ultrasound and the color pixels are photoacoustic data. So these pigs didn't take very good care of their teeth and they had a lot of background staining. And so that's coated in blue. And then I drew in the gingival margin in PowerPoint. And then after we irrigated the pocket, we are coding the signal from the squid ink nanoparticles in red. And so, you know, a couple things that's really interesting is the variation in the pocket, right? And so if you would have just randomly probed here, you might think, oh, two millimeter pocket, you're good to go. Or over here, five millimeter pocket, you need, you need more advanced care. When in reality, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's variation, which makes biological sense. Um, the second thing is the, um, how, how deep it actually matches the, uh, the true clinical value that we measured with a periodontal probe. Um, and so this was done for 40 teeth and we're showing really good correlation between the depth by imaging and the depth by probing. Um, let me just comment briefly on the, the two color channels here. And so this is just simply done by the differences in the photoacoustic spectra. So this was done with an OPO laser. And so we could simply just subtract the data by imaging at two wavelengths. I think this was 680 and 800. And so we could um, code the stain versus the ink. So that's one of the strengths of the technique. Um, if you look at this as a sagittal section, I, I really love this image because here you're seeing this probing depth right here so what that is, is just a single plane into the board. And what we start to get here is a lot more information about the underlying bone. This region right here, if you can appreciate, there's a very subtle decrease 
in the bone density right here. And so that's called the semantoenamel junction. And that's the interface between where it stops being dentin on top of bone and it's just bone. And periodontists care about that a lot. And that's a, a, an, an active area of research. And it's nice that it doesn't even involve photoacoustics. Uh, you can see the gingiva, and then here you can see the top of the tooth. So lots of information in these images. I should mention, I didn't mention this earlier, this was done with a visual sonic scanner. So this is a company, a, a Canadian company that uh, does high frequency imaging. So this was done at 40 megahertz, um, also with a tunable laser. So again, like I said, it correlates nicely with the, um, with the gold standard. Uh, we can look at shallow pockets, medium pockets, deep pockets. Um, and then the other really powerful application of this is the ability to look at this gingival thickness. So if this is a sagittal section of your tooth, how thick is the gingiva, right? And so the way they do this now is they take that same periodontal probe and basically look, can they see the probe through your gum? And if they can, that means it's thin. And if they can't, it means it's thick. So basically totally qualitative, but high frequency ultrasound has the ability to measure this to, to two decimal points. And why, do you, why should you care? In North America, at least, it's very common for people to do gum flap transplants. And so they'll take some uh, tissue from the top of your mouth and transplant it. And so this would be a way to either convince people they need to have it or that they don't need to have it. Um, but to convince ourselves that this works by imaging, we measured this um, with a um, calipers in the swine and then also by imaging and looked for um, any difference between the two techniques using Bland-Altman analysis and showed that these um, corresponded quite well. So you rinse your mouth with this squid ink. Is it on there forever? Well, it's stable, but you can remove it with uh, tooth brushing. This is not gonna permanently change your, the color of your teeth, um, as you can see here. We can also do endogenous imaging. So this is unpublished data in a rabbit model. And so here, these are cross sections. Um, here you can see the these white spots right here are the incisors of the rabbit. And then this area is the gingiva. And so we took this rabbit and put it on different oxygen tensions. And so we could just control how much oxygen it was breathing. And so you can appreciate using photoacoustic imaging, we could back calculate how much of the oxygen in that tissue was oxygenated. And so you can see when we move it down to five or 10% oxygen, indeed, this rabbit um, has less oxygenated hemoglobin. And then we could compare that to a pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter works surprisingly well on a rabbit's paw, even with the fur, um, if you trim it back just a little bit. So that was just to convince ourselves that this worked in this model. And then we took um, a piece of suture and soaked it in Porphyzomus gingivalis, which is a, uh, Porphyzomus gingivalis causes periodontal disease. And over time, it causes periodontal disease, um, a model of periodontal disease. And in this same rabbit, we saw a small but significant decrease in the amount of uh, oxygenation. So this hypoxia is a known imaging biomarker of periodontal disease. So if you look at this image, you might say, yeah, I get it. The tooth, the gum is red, the, re the animal has periodontal disease. But what you're not going to get by visual inspection is the extent of the infiltration or the 3D um, distribution of the disease in that gingiva. And so that's what photoacoustic imaging can do. Um, we have done this now in about uh, 90 human subjects. Um, so this is one of the first where we could just, part of the issue was immobilizing the head. So this is just an image to show you how we immobilize the head. Um, and we could image um, tooth seven through 10 
and tooth 27 through 22. So these are the anterior teeth, the teeth in the front of the mouth. The reason these are the only ones we could image is because of the very relatively large size of the transducer we were using. We simply just couldn't get to the molars. Unfortunately, the molars are more important because that's the more common site of disease. But what you can see is this really nice, these sagittal images where we're looking at the gingival thickness. We can start to see the interface between the dentin and the bone. And then we could also go ahead and irrigate this patient, um, well, this healthy volunteer, um, and again, image the periodontal pocket in this tooth, very similar to the swine image. So this, um, we ha haven't published a lot on that scent for a couple years because we've had this ongoing trial at the University of Southern California. There is no dental school in San Diego, so it has been a logistical challenge of getting this um, set up, but it took about a year and then COVID happened, but we finally um, have a, a fairly large patient data set now that we're in the process of, of analyzing and that will be exciting to publish. The other thing in this space is two of my students formed a company called Stylosonics. And so they've recently got a couple small pieces of funding from the federal government to build a device similar to this. It's gonna basically gonna be a small transducer on a stick to be able to access the molars. So that's also um, exciting. And then the last topic that I'll talk about is um, this collaboration with Daniel and Maya and um, is in the area of wound imaging. I'm gonna use the generic term wound, but it incorporates many different types of disease, right? So this can be bed sores or decubitus ulcers. This can be um, an arterial insufficiency injury. These can be diabetic foot ulcers. There's a variety of reasons why people have these chronic non-healing wounds. And so the challenge is that these are still largely imaged by visual inspection. The day-to-day the -day care of these wounds is, is mostly visual inspection, but there's obviously a lot of disease that is below the skin surface. Um, for time, I may briefly mention this first animal study that we did, and this was a really gnarly animal study where we basically used magnets to simulate a bed sore, a decubitus ulcer, by putting pressure on the animal's um, underlying muscle tissue and skin. And so the number of times you use this magnetic treatment, you could create different stages of diabetic, or excuse me, not diabetic, decubitus ulcers. And so we made these models, we used histology to show that indeed we were disrupting the skin in early stages and the skin and the muscle in advanced stages. And then we imaged uh, with both ultrasound and photoacoustics. And we see that not only in advanced stages is there more signal at depth, but there's also more overall higher signal as a function of stage. And so we could look at both the pixel intensity and the pixel depth and show, yes, we can stratify these models of decubitus ulcer by stage. But more importantly, we wanted to see, could we detect them before they were visible by eye? So we zoomed in on those very early stages when we were just doing one round, two rounds, three rounds of magnetic treatment, because that would be what would have real value is to start to predict when the wound is gonna erupt before it was visible by eye. And so what we found is that indeed we could start to detect a difference after only three rounds um, and by, by imaging when the, it, it takes through fifth, five rounds for it to be a true stage one ulcer that uh, could be detectable by eye. So this was enough to get a little funding from the NIH and move on to some uh, human subjects work. 
Um, this is mostly done with Dr. Caesar Anderson, who runs the wound clinic in San Diego. He has a large hyperbaric chamber. They wheel like eight people in there at a time, turn it up to two atmospheres of oxygen to try to just force oxygen into these people's wounds. It's a really, he does skin grafts day in and day out. He, he's a real miracle worker in terms of these people that they're, the general practitioner is saying, you're going to lose this foot. And so he'll, he'll, he'll save their foot. It's pretty amazing. Pranav Garamella is a nephrologist and so works a lot with patients on di dialysis. Dialysis patients are at high risk of these kinds of um, uh, insufficiency injuries, diabetic ulcers. And then Bill Penny is at the Veterans Administration and has a lot of patients with uh, bed sores. And so three kind of unique clusters of disease. This work um, doesn't use the visual sonic system. This uses a system from a Japanese company called Cyberdyne. And the main difference is that all the previous work I showed you used a pulsed laser. And pulsed lasers are great. They have high energy, they have short pulse widths, they have a high rep rate. The main strength is you can do spectra, right? So that's really powerful. The problem is that they always break. <laughs> and the ones from North America break, the ones from Europe break, the ones even from Bavaria break sometimes. <laughs> um, and so for a, for a translatable system, it's gotta be more reliable than that. And so this Japanese company has developed these LEDs and the LEDs are not particularly innovative, but what's innovative is the drivers that they have that can pulse them at 50 nanoseconds. And so, these LEDs, you can drop them on the floor, you can roll them down the hall on a cart, you pick them up, dust them off, and they're just as strong as they ever were before. So really, really powerful. The main limitation, and they're about a log order more affordable, the main limitation is the fluence. So with an OPO laser, we're working at millijoules, and here we're at microjoules. And here's more of the specs if you care about it. Um, so how do you get around that? How do, you, how do you still do imaging with a thousand fold less power? And the answer is you simply increase the rep rate. And so our rep rates here are now three, four, two, three, four thousand. So we're, we're simply averaging a lot more data. But the way that we can get away with that is because each of these pulses is only 50 nanoseconds. So we can still almost have video frame rate by averaging 3,000 photoacoustic events per second, okay? The other kind of negative here is we only are, have a couple wavelengths, right? So we can, or they can, interspace these LEDs. So do you want it 680, want it 850? And we can have two different wavelengths in one of these strips that are on either side of the transducer, but we're, we're really limited in the, in the wavelength choice. Uh, we'll skip that. So that's the instrument that we were doing. We first wanted to look at a very simple kind of question. Could we, could we just use the ultrasound? What does the ultrasound look like in people with these wounds? And so um, these are the wound sizes for uh, 45 human subjects measured by ultrasound and measured by um, the, the clinical measurement. And so we do match um, the, the, the size that's uh, erupted through the skin surface at least. So very simple exercise, but we passed it. The next um, example is starting to look at skin grafting and can we monitor wound healing after a skin graft. So this is a pre-skin graft image and you can see the tibia sticking through this wound. And this is immediately after the skin graft. And so you can sort of see the sutures here um, of this patient. I mean, this, this wound looks pretty bad, right? The, the skin around it is pretty necrotic, limited perfusion in this tissue. This is the treatment of this particular patient. 
So this patient didn't start out immediately as a skin graft. They first tried some, uh, some negative pressure, some compression dressings, debridement, nothing was getting better. So on day 50, roughly, that's when they initiated or Dr. Anderson initiated a skin graft. So day one, right after the skin graft, and then a couple months after the skin graft. So you can really notice the obvious improvement in the images, at least the, the photographs. What I'm showing here in the middle is this plane right here shown in blue. And so you can appreciate at, at baseline, the ultrasound at least doesn't show a ton of disease. But as this patient progresses, this patient is not healing. You start to notice this large hypoechoic region, and you can even see the skin graft right here, all on top of the tibia as an anatomic landmark. And then over time, you can start to appreciate how that hyperechoic region, excuse me, hypoechoic region starts to fill in with healthy tissue. And this is contrasted with the healthy region over here on the right, where we are simply imaging a plane over here that's outside of the wound bed. So this is just a simple demonstration of the, the ability to see, is there response to therapy below this skin graft? So we went on and looked at four different patients that had skin grafts on roughly the same trajectory and showed that we see this decrease in the ultrasound signal intensity at some point that got bad enough that um, the clinical symptoms indicated that a skin graft was needed. And then this mean ultrasound gray value starts to recover as the tissue becomes more healthy, becomes more, um, has, has an echogenicity similar to healthy tissue. Um, we could also quantitate the um, wound area over time using these same uh, patient metrics and show that it decreases um, after the skin graft is initiated. That makes sense. The wound is getting smaller. Um, and then finally, this is kind of um, not necessarily expected, but that a larger wound area has a lower ultrasound contrast with healthier tissue because there's a lack of healthier tissue there. And so as the wound becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, that mean ultrasound gray value increases because you simply have more connective tissue, you have more muscle tissue, and so this is filling back in. So this is all in this, the pure ultrasound space. Um, Tunneling wounds, also, this was kind of unexpected. This is um, unpublished data because we don't have a lot of these cases, but I, I'm eager to get more cases like these, where if you look at this wound, and here's a high magnif higher magnification image, where does the wound end? I mean, to me, it ends right there where my laser pointer is. But when you look at it with ultrasound, it actually tunnels, and this is a, a clinical term, a tunneling wound. And so when we looked at this with just B-mode ultrasound, you can look at these different planes, one, two, three, four, five, and I have them labeled up here, one, two, three, four, five. And so for frame three, which is two centimeters away from the apparent edge of the wound, this patient still has a really a ton of disease. Um, and uh, really, this is, these are one centimeter scale bars. So a two centimeter lesion that is not visible by eye at all. And then as you move farther up frame four, frame five, we're kind of finally back to healthy tissue. But frame five or plane five is four centimeters from the opening of the wound. So that's just ultrasound. What about um, photoacoustics? Here, this is um, one plane over time. And so there's several things you can notice. One is that the wound is um, becoming less 
hypoechoic, right? It's filling in with normal tissue as time goes on. Thing two, you can appreciate this increased scar formation that's happening in, in the bed of the wound. And then thing three is this increased neovascularization, this increase in the photoacoustic signal represented by red pixels over time. And so we could start to quantitate these um, for, for different times in different patients and show this um, significant increase in the perfusion. And so the hope then is that this will be an imaging biomarker of people who are not responding. Right. If there is not an increase in neovascularization, this patient needs another skin graft. This patient needs to go to hyperbaric treatment. There needs to be some sort of alternative uh, treatment because this is what we see in people who respond. So in the last few slides, then I just want to mention, like, that's why I'm here, is that um, image analysis here is a disaster. <laughs> so a typical scan is 700 to 1500 frames. Um, we're getting 175 frames per scan, and we normally do multiple scans per event. Right now, I've got a couple just very dedicated uh, master's students who are helping annotate these images and draw these ROIs. Um, so we're working, you know, right now we have about 50,000 frames of, of images and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation, especially when we're trying to discriminate between the wound and the healthy tissue above. When you start to draw multiple ROIs, it becomes a real challenge. Um, so, you know, just some of the things we, we annotate. One is that there is a probe cover over this. So we always will sometimes have a, uh, some signal from the probe cover. Um, it's really nice when we're imaging over bone just because it does add a landmark. Um, we draw in these kinds of ROIs and then expect the data. Thank you guys. Um, and so the ideal scenario would be, um, you know, export these as RF files, do some image reconstruction, um, and then automated segmentation to export details about wound margins, wound volume, perfusion, and healing rates. And so we're not there yet, but hopefully there can be ongoing collaboration to move in this direction. Maya, thank you for all your work in, in getting this started. Um, so I guess just with the last few slides, I just want to mention a couple other projects. Very briefly, we have an ongoing collaboration with Bill Vogt at the FDA to develop uh, photoacoustic calibration phantoms. So phantoms are tough in this space because they have to both have acoustic properties and optical properties. And so there's been a lot of work in the separate fields, but doing those at the same time has, has lagged. And so I think those will hopefully be useful to the whole community. Um, a lot of work on LEDs. Um, it wouldn't be 2021 if I didn't mention COVID. This is a, an amazing, I love this SEM image that my student took of a cross section of an N95 respirator and looking at the different layers. Um, We've been working a lot on using MPRO. This is the main protease in, um, that's involved in the viral life cycle of SARS. And so making fluorescent probes, photoacoustic probes, a variety of different approaches to measure this protease as a surrogate for SARS infection, SARS-CoV-2. And then the current project is putting this colorimetric reagent into this sticker that would go either on the outside of a mask or more likely on the inside of a mask. And at the end of the day, you would click that blister pack to release the reagents. And if they change colors, if both flames change colors, that means you may have been exposed. Um, so I wanna thank everybody in the group, um, really good group right now. And then just mention that um, I do appreciate my funding sources. Um, FAU for the invitation, and we're always recruiting talented folks to Southern California. It's a great place to live for a couple years or for longer. Um, so thanks again. Jesse, thank you for this presentation. This was really an exciting talk.
And I see there's a couple of questions in the chat that our audience is actually asking. And I'll, I'll start here with the first question. So how stable is the heparin dose over time? So if you adjust it for a patient, Will it stay constant for several weeks, months, or how often? The heparin dose is very non-stable. So the question about heparin stability, it's a, there's constantly uh, renal excretion and um, there's increased heparin sensitivity. So it's a constantly dynamic situation. Um, and so that's why they have to keep giving subsequent doses. And so that's why doing this monitoring event with high frequency is important because by the time you do a blood draw and get the results back three hours later, that may no longer be the scenario in the patient. Excellent. And how quantitative is the normalized photoacoustic signal? So I guess you need a similar sensor set up in all of the patients, but is it also susceptible to body weight or? Yeah, absolutely. It's susceptible to body weight. It's susceptible to patient size. Um, it's also susceptible to variations in the laser power. Um, and so what we can do is uh, measure the laser fluence that comes out of that transducer and use that to, to compensate for that. Um, but in terms of absolute quantitation, most pay, and that's the beauty of imaging is that most patients serve as their own control. And so um, we're looking at relative differences within one patient rather than between patients. Excellent. So the next question here is, what, uh, what temperature difference is needed for the photoacoustic signal to be readable? Could it impact any of the hard parts of the teeth, for example? Um, so we're not really changing the temperature of the tissue. It's um, the, well, excuse me, while we are shining light, we are creating thermal expansion that absorbed energy is being dissipated as that expansion rather than as temperature, rather than as heat. So I would, don't think about the, the tissue as heating up. Um, and so really we've, we've never, I've, we've studied this carefully, many groups have studied this carefully. So of all the things that could go wrong with this, the, the least thing I'm worried about is bulk heating. Um, but then, but then the notion of, is the mouth filled with water when you do the imaging? Do you use gel? Great question. Um, you have to do coupling. And so we are using gel. The other thing you can do is use a sleeve and fill the sleeve with water and rest the sleeve onto the surface. But yeah, coupling is still, is still a requirement. Cool. Jesse, this was a wonderful presentation. And we have an excited audience here. And also great to have talks again in person and in this hybrid mode. So I'm really enjoying this. Great to have you here as a guest. And thanks again for this great presentation. Thank you.